Hello and welcome to Green Shoots and a big thank you for taking the time to join us. So we have a panel of genuine rock stars for you today and the focus of this session is how the pandemic is fundamentally changing international business, what companies are doing to accelerate the new normal and what new business models and tech will kind of shape economic and social interactions going forward. Today, we're also super special, it's super special for us because we partnered with the great folks at the Milken Institute Asia. And we have Laura from the Milken Institute joining us today too. So welcome and thanks again for your great support. It'd be great if you could share some of the exciting initiatives that the Milken Institute is currently up, up to at the moment. Thank you, Pat. Thank you so much for, uh, for allowing uh, the Milken Institute to collaborate with you and your Green Shoots webinar series. Uh, the Milken Institute is a proud partner of the Singapore Spintech Festival. Uh, we've been partnering with you guys for a couple of years and we hope to continue the partnership. Uh, for those of you who don't know the Milken Institute, let me tell you a little bit about us. Um, we're a not-for-profit, nonpartisan global think tank uh, founded by Mike Milken in 1991. Uh, we have been in Asia for seven years and everything we do focuses on two pillars, health and finance. And so we're very much at the heart of the current crisis, our work our work is very much in the heart of the current crisis. In health, uh, what we're doing is that we're tracking treatments and cures for COVID-19. Uh, so far, we have uh, tracked the usage and efficiency of 227 treatments for COVID-19. And we're also tracking the development of 159 vaccines around the world. So we are very hopeful that we can uh, play a role in, 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 the, in the capital and funding of some of these vaccines and bringing people together to, uh, to then take the treatment to people around the world. You know, our work in finance, basically, it's, it's around convening leaders in business and finance to have dialogues like the one we're having today, to basically reassess and reimagine the future ahead. Well, every day the world looks a little more different than it did six months ago. We're seeing entrepreneurs and business leaders come, with creative, come up with creative and innovative ways to tackle their, the new business environment. Uh, we see that ad adaptability is a new model of the era. Um, business who adapt their models are the ones that are going to do well. Um, and, and that means revising old assumptions, being nimble as the world is changing on a daily basis. Um, the other thing that we're kind of urging leaders to is to stop and reset and think about the big picture issues. So it's also thinking about, you know, ESG, climate change, sustainability implications, social and governmental issues. So we don't have to carry on as we were doing before, but we can actually work together to rebuild and support equality, inclusiveness, sustainability for the sake of our communities and, and countries. So Pat, I know that was a little bit long winded, but thank you so much for, um, for partnering with us. Thank you, Laura. And it's, um, it's really great to hear some of the initiatives that you guys are up to. And uh, clearly, everyone uh, on the panel, and I'm sure everyone that's listening in, you know, would love to support in some way, shape or form. Um, so thanks again, Laura. <clears throat> and I'd just like to say, as always, um, we'll do our best to weave in your questions. So from the audience, please kind of just reach out via the Q&A functionality. Any questions that we don't get round to addressing, we'll follow up in a blog post uh, in a couple of days time. So as a society and industry, we've all been through or are going through a number of kind of phases of isolation, whether that's at home, in your companies, from your customers, from the industry sector, or as a nation, and certainly as a region. And we're beginning to see a phased approach in many countries to opening up following lockdown. And, you know, it's great to see some of the domestic business activity result, uh, resuming. But to kickstart our kind of collective recovery and growth, um, international business activity needs to pick up. And the focus of the conversation today will be around the startup playbook for international business activity. So kind of on that note, I'd like to introduce our very first speaker, who is a real and genuine rock star in the VC world. As a child, Jenny wanted to be either an astronaut or a genetic engineer. I'm sure I can speak on behalf of the tech community, Jenny, that we're so glad you decided to focus your energy and time at GGV. And as managing partner, she's been instrumental in helping 10 early stage companies go public, plus numerous exits. Jenny launched GGV's first office in China in 2005 and reopened GGV's Singapore office in 2019. It's a real honor to have you on the show, Jenny. So Jenny, I've got a quick question for you. So you've just come back from the US 
and you're currently holed up in, in Sentosa. And thinking about it, you're probably the first person I've met in months that's actually traveled. So I kind of want to ask you, how, how was your trip? Yeah, hi everyone. It's good to be back here. Uh, this time I get to uh, try out a new hotel. I, I never stay in a hotel in Singapore because I think as many of you know, Singapore is home to me as well. My mom is here, my family is here. Um, so yes, I'm now quarantine day nine uh, in the Shangri-La in Sentosa. And uh, if you have to be quarantined anywhere else in the world, I think uh, pick Singapore because uh, it's, a, it's a good place. The background I have is, is the view I get every day <laughs> over the last 10 days. So I have been traveling quite a bit. I was in China uh, obviously up to uh, January and then uh, saw how the um, you know, virus situation erupted. Then I traveled to Singapore, I uh, was here for a couple of weeks. And when I thought Asia was not too safe, you know, I decided to go pay my investor a visit in the US. And so I was in the US from New York to Columbus to Georgia and then back to the West Coast. Uh, and so have seen um, that truly, you know, this pandemic does not leave any stone unturned, right? Um, and so I made it back uh, almost a week plus ago, um, was on a plane from LA back here. And it's, um, uh, it's, a, it's a good experience. You get checked a lot, you know, people get you to fill up a lot of questionnaire. And I get to be one of the 30 passenger on the plane that was back here in the 17 hours flight direct. Um, so, so far so good. If you have to travel and it's really critical, it's, it's not too bad. Wear your mask, you know, keep yourself clean, wash your hands. Um, actually, I think it's the attitude that counts. Um, so net net, um, I, I do believe that, you know, viruses will pass and, you know, the world will come back. This is the sixth time I've seen an you know, a down cycle. I was in Hong Kong and Simon would know, I was in Hong Kong during SARS in 03, yeah. lived through that as well. And then of course, on top of that scene, you know, market cycles goes through up and down. I think this one is a little different um, from SARS, it's a little different from 9-11, uh, but net net, I think it's a, um, it's a challenge, right? It's a challenge for the startup communities. It's a challenge for um, governments around the world. But I, I think that this is time where I do see that it's um, the creativity, the innovation, and that uh, resilience um, that will see us through the time. It's good to, be, good to be back. It's great to hear the positive vibes, Jenny. Um, and, and hopefully that, that permeates across uh, this part of the world too. So it's good to have you back. And so um, moving on to our next speaker um, is Simon, the founder and group CEO of WeLab. As a child, he wanted to be a physicist but decided against this and turned his attention to the world of financial services. WeLab is the one of the first virtual banks to be established in Hong Kong. And prior to WeLab, he served stints at Citibank and Standard Chartered. Thank you very much for joining us, Simon. Thank you, Pat. So congrats on the launch of your recent initiative, um, HK Cash Drop. Um, very timely in more ways than one. Um, so I just want to ask you, how do you see the fintech market in, in Hong Kong evolving? You know, in particular that you seem to be quite far ahead as a country compared to other parts of Asia in terms of post-lockdown. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, think, I think fintech has progressed quite a lot in Hong Kong in the last couple of years. Um, you've seen us, uh, the Hong Kong uh, Monetary Authority issued eight virtual banking licenses, around four to five of them already like pilot launch or launch. In addition to that, they just issued four virtual insurance licenses and around 13 we'll call uh, store value facility licenses, right? So the ecosystem is pretty established now. Um, and I think in addition to this, right, what we've seen recently in the, in the, in the current COVID-19 situation, right, uh, more people adopting to using uh, financial services online which is a fantastic thing, right? I think they have, they're left with no choice. They cannot go and queue up in a branch anymore, right? And what, we've, what we said is, is the analogy is like, once you start buying movie tickets on your mobile phone, you'll never go back to queuing. So once you start doing financial transactions online, you will not go back even when the branches are open in, in, in the future. Um, if I compare, so we also run uh, one of the largest online lending platform in Hong Kong called WeLand, right? If I compare March volume this year versus March volume last year, right? The online lending volume increased by 36%. So the volume is actually increasing quite healthily. And, and of those increase, right, 51% of the increase actually came from people 30 years and below. So you talked a little bit about what's changed, um, but what, what do you see as remaining the same? Um, I, 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 
I don't think anything will be the same after this, right? I think uh, banks are changing. I, we can talk a little bit about that too, right? About how bank operations are changing. We see how work from home change the environment. We even see how the business continuity planning of banks also have to change, right? If you think about it as in the past, right? Uh, uh, banks, the business continuity plan, probably just plan for one day, typhoon day, or in, in the West, right? In, in the USA, time for a snow day, right? But now you have to have a business continuity plan of a month, right, of every single function, not just the customer service or the people at the branch, right? So I think everything has changed, our mode of operation has changed. I think um, we have to adapt, it is the, the survival of the, not the fittest, but the people can adapt the fastest. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And I think we'll, we'll certainly dig into some of that um, a bit later in the session. But next up, I'd like to introduce um, Sabir, who as a child wanted to be uh, an army officer, just like his father. Um, in his spare time, he is the CEO of Policy Bazaar, having joined less than a year ago. Prior to Policy Bazaar, he was a managing partner at Waterbridge Ventures and served in senior leadership positions at digital and media companies. So welcome and thanks for joining us from India, Sabri. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Glad to be here. So it's been some journey for you, Sabri, and um, you know, with 75%, I think, around of your business in the insurance sector, I'm just keen to understand a little bit more about what your strategy has been since lockdown began in India. Yeah, so Pat, I, just to give an introduction to Policy Bazaar, we are sort of the largest uh, digital distributor of insurance in India. And coincidentally, we are also the largest distributor of insurance, whether digital or physical in India, uh, independent digital distributor. So uh, we are a large part of the industry. And as you can imagine, uh, post COVID, uh, you know, digital distribution has become far more important because people can't go into banks or talk to agents or meet agents rather. So, you know, our channel has become uh, super critical and uh, we have obviously seen tremendous growth in the last two, three months compared to uh, last year and the months before that. And what is interesting is the profile of the customers is also changing. You know, people who would never have bought insurance, uh, I think to Simon's point, uh, digitally before are now buying it. Uh, we also focus on protection. So our business is built around protection products, which are term insurance and health insurance. Uh, and these are obviously again, top of mind for consumers. So what we see is a, you know, a bit of a step change in the way people buy insurance in India. Uh, you know, it takes a lot of time to move uh, industries like insurance, but slowly I think we are moving and uh, again, people who experience the digital journey, I think will find buying digitally will be far more uh, superior experience to buying uh, physically. I, from my own personal perspective, I certainly hope so. Um, and uh, so our, our last speaker is Dirk. What can I say about Dirk? Not being content with one dream, he had three aspirations as a child to be a diplomat in Germany or a shoe salesman. He settled for his third option in the world of corporate finance. I'm sure that it was a tough decision. It must've been quite marginal between the, the three career choices. In his spare time, Dirk is the founding managing partner at Vnext with investments in early stage startups in Southeast Asia and beyond. The fund has now invested in over 120 companies in over 10 countries. Thanks for joining us, Dirk. Thanks, thanks, Pat, for having us and the introduction. <laughs> Trying to keep a straight face. <laughs> no problem. Um, so, Dirk, uh, I, and this is a story I just wanted to share quickly. So, I remember our, our meeting that we had um, at your co-working space way back in February, and it seemed as January. If had... Yeah, I think it was January. Yeah. Actually, yeah, it was January. It was it was that early. Um, and at the time, I am. Um, I think you had a crystal ball because you called out the signs of a, a potential pandemic. Um, you called out what this could look like and what this would mean to, to the world. And I must admit at the time, I thought you were super paranoid. Um, however, most of the things that you've said that would happen have played out. So kind of on that note, um, I'm going to refer to you as Nostradamus. And um, what, what are some of the key macro trends that you're seeing in this region in the context of business, international business activity. So yeah, th thanks a lot. Thanks for having us. Thanks thanks again for the introduction. So briefly, um, who, who are we and what has been next? So we're, we're a small venture fund based out of Singapore, invest in India, Southeast Asia. So that's, that's our core territory, sit on the early side of venture and hence have been in the fortunate position to have an exposure actually in many countries. 
and having had the, the fortune to, to learn from these countries what is happening and how entrepreneurs are tackling, tackling um, the COVID, COVID shock as a society, as a country, as individual companies by, by different verticals. And I think a fundamental shift that ties in maybe with geopolitical tension as well is supply chain, and it's an obvious one, right? Um, so we're seeing early signs of supply chain shifts away from uh, the, the tensious relationship between China and 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 um, and um, the U.S. So I think from a financial perspective that will have huge implications. I personally am thinking, as far as um, you know, five years out, will there be only one reserve currency, and what could that look like or not? Um, and I think there are potentially very interesting fundamental shifts on. You know, like if you if you go back in time and you ask yourself, how did the U.S. dollar become a reserve currency to begin with? Um, it was post bread and Woods. So it was a transition from the underlying that had a lot superior properties, so from gold to fiat, or from gold to paper to fiat, right? And now we have an underlying that could be potentially superior, paired with uh, sort of very large debt volumes in the world and desperation to pay these back post World War One and Two. Um, and then sort of like a option of, of the reserve currency um, trade corridor by corridor. So I think, I think those are some pretty big, big shifts. Um, then obviously more abstractly, what I'm thinking about is a lot also in line with, with the topic of internationalization. I'm, I'm thinking of the opportunity on the one hand, but more so actually on the cost side and how the costs in a post-COVID world of doing international business has fundamentally changed. So almost like a tax being health compliant, right? Jenny can sing a song of that right now, sitting, sitting two weeks in isolation because she returned from a country, right? And how does that affect like a B2B sales force that focuses enterprise and is used to close um, B2B deals? And then maybe lastly, I think we don't give enough credit really to banks. So I think, I think if we would have sat here and had this conversation and the financial ecosystem overall, if we would have sat here six months ago and said, we would be able to disperse a trillion, several trillion dollars to I don't know how many income households and do that through basically 2000 banks in the US and a lot of them of small, medium size where folks stood there and working 12 hours a day shifts to make that happen. I think most of us would have said, hey, impossible in a scenario of work from home, right? So I think what would that lead to is actually COVID being a massive change engine, change engine of digital transformation from a B2B perspective. Hey, that transition to work from home was actually easier than we thought from a bank's perspective. What else can we invest in to be ready, right? So I think that question is omnipresent across industries right now. You touched upon quite a few kind of uh, macro trends and I just want to see, um, Jenny, you, you were nodding to, to some of these. I'm um, just wanting to see if you had any, any comments on this or, or anything to add. Well, I think on the, um, maybe on the micro level, um, on the portfolio um, perspective, um, definitely it's a, it's a mindset change, right? So we have, um, you know, GGB, we have investments in the US, in China, um, and also, you know, in Southeast Asia as well. I think in the past, you know, the whole globalization, um, uh, you know, direction is something that portfolio could leverage, right? They could leverage manufacturing in China. They could leverage, um, say, IP protection in Singapore. They could leverage, you know, having R&D centers in the U.S. And so, you know, um, similarly for supply chain, right? You don't have to build, design, and manufacture all the chips that yourself, right? You could leverage from what's available out there in terms of mature technology. You could leverage from, you know, skill in, the, uh, in production economy. But I think that, um, you know, today, the current situation has caused many companies to rethink what that means. Um, you know, how do you continue to leverage, you know, global um, ecosystem, supply chain, markets, and yet ensure that you have redundancy built into your process, right? We have portfolio companies that before, you know, were sourcing from China, a US company sourcing from China and Italy. And so when we had our board meeting back in February, I said, hey, China is shut. 
make sure you buy loads uh, from Italy, right? Because it's going to be a while before China comes back. And if you want to continue to sell a product and they are in the business of industrial cleaning, which is actually one of the beneficiary um, from, from this, right? Because you want to send robots into the facility versus, you know, uh, men, right? And so they uh, took the advice, load up on the uh, components from Italy. And then by the next board meeting in April, uh, both ecosystems were shut, right? Because Italy was also locked down. So I, I think it's just one simple example of a supply chain where even for startups, sometimes we go with a single source because it's more efficient. You don't have enough volume. You know, you, you want to concentrate that volume to get the best pricing. But I think in the new world, you know, you have to make sure that there is diversification. We have another company, more local, uh, even on a local basis, in, uh, um, they are in Beijing. And as you know, in China, the situation of the virus control, the opening up of the businesses uh, also is relatively different depending on the city. And so the CEO called me up and he said, you know, Jenny, we're now going to have a second headquarter in Shenzhen, <laughs> maybe Hong Kong. Uh, but Shenzhen first, right? And why? Because if they are, their sales guys are in Beijing, their team is in Beijing, and for them now, if you travel out to close that sale, you're going to be quarantined. You're going to be quarantined 14 days in destination and then 14 days coming back. And so the CEO has decided to partition his team so that he has, you know, half of his sales team and his engineering team in Shenzhen. And that decision was made, like, you know, over a couple of days. So I think, again, um, not just on the supply chain, um, on the global aspects, even on the internal, you know, business continuity redundancy perspective, it's forcing companies to rethink how business models will look like. And then thirdly, I'll, I'll have another example. We have another company that's in the education tech sector, you know, uh, um, again, one that's doing a lot of good by delivering, you know, online education to all the kids at home. And they have 3,000 teachers dispersed all over, whether different parts of China. Um, and, um, you know, before these guys have to come into the office. So they have like offices for them. It's like studio where they, the teachers go on online and you have to cater for their, um, you know, um, uh, studio setting, right? In terms of rental, in terms of uh, facility. And overnight, the CEO is telling me he's going to go from 3,000 seats for the teachers to now 300. Because, you know, post-virus, he does not foresee having to keep physical space for 3,000 teachers. All he wants to do is have the teachers come in for three months to go through the training and then bring their computer home. So now you have the benefit of having teachers now across different cities in China. Of the 3,000, he actually has like 500 in Wuhan, which is in lockdown mode, right? And so now you can disperse your resources um, and at the same time um, also optimize your OPEX as well. So it's, you know, different examples, but I think it's, um, uh, it's forcing, you know, startups big and small to rethink what that business model is going to look like. Uh, and it's not just on how they deliver services. It's not just how they manage their ecosystem or their supply chain, but it's also in like the, the heart of basic things. When you think about, let's go to office and everybody employee should be there because it's culture building. I think even culture building will take on a very different uh, definition in the new world. So there were a number of uh, re really good sound bites, Sarah. And before I ask Simon to kind of re respond from from his perspective or WeLab perspective, I just want to engage the audience um, with with a poll that we've got. And so, uh, Dawn, if you could bring the audience poll up, please. And so the question for the audience is: um, Which of the following is the biggest impediment to international expansion for startups today? And I know that there are there are a lot more than the the, the, the five that we've, we've put up here. Um, sadly, the panelists can't vote. So, um, but what we'll do is once the audience um, uh, provide their responses, we'll, we'll start to kind of muse over, you know, what, what, what the audience see as, as some of the biggest impediments. And, and so while that's going on, um, Simon, it would be good to kind of understand your perspective, because I think Jenny's talked quite a bit around um, redefining business models. She's talked quite a bit around the global ecosystem, supply chains. Um, and I just wanted to see from a wee lab perspective, um, how, how does that compare some of these trends that you're seeing coming down the line? Mm -hmm. I think I think definitely the um, the, the economy uh, has evolved quite differently uh, across the markets, right? I mean, we look at China as the first to get locked down, and then Hong Kong, and then um, 
the West and then coming back to uh, Southeast Asia. And then, because we, we're in three markets, right? We're, we're a mainland China business, a Hong Kong business, and Indonesia business, right? Um, the China business, what we're seeing in terms of, uh, so in three markets, we operate roughly in the same area in uh, digital lending, uh, digital bank, and also a B2B business where we license softwares to facilitate banks from doing so, right? So we get a broad spectrum of how these markets are performing, right? I think in the China market, definitely we see the delinquency increasing. Um, and I think a lot of banks are, are tightening the credit policies and stuff like that, right? Um, but I think thankfully being the first to lock down and resume, we do see the credit performance in China improving from April and May. In terms of Hong Kong, Hong Kong generally, uh, the bankruptcy is increasing, uh, but thankfully Hong Kong being a, a smaller sort of uh, economy well contained, I, I think the, the coronavirus situation has greatly improved. Um, but what we're seeing is, this, uh, what we concern more is a secondary impact. We always talk about the coronavirus as a primary impact and a secondary impact. The primary impact is when people cannot go out working from home. The secondary impact is the impact to the economy, which is a lot more, uh, a lot, lot longer duration. So what we're waiting for is to see what's actually gonna happen in Hong Kong. Interestingly, right? If we look at the Hong Kong market, the greatest source of uh, uh, consumer write-off is bankruptcy. Even the bankruptcy court in Hong Kong was closed. So actually nobody knew what's the bankruptcy situation in Hong Kong until the court just reopened a couple of weeks ago, right? And the third is obviously Indonesia. So uh, funny enough, when Hong Kong and the when Hong Kong China office closed down, we immediately call our Indonesian colleagues and say, okay, be careful. They will hit Indonesia, buy some mask, buy some like uh, office uh, hand, hand sanitizer and stuff like that. Because when, when it hits Indonesia, you cannot buy it anymore, right? Uh, so Indonesia is experiencing that now. We also see the Indonesia uh, delinquency uh, slowly edging up as well. So I think I think generally we are being more cautious in, in all the markets. Um, thankfully, we can scale some experiences across the board um, and we hope to see certain recovery uh, in the third quarter. Now, I think when we first started looking at this, right, everyone was at, let's say, February. We, 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 we're trying to model this after a SaaS scenario. I think the closest was SaaS, where people were expecting a V-shaped recovery six months later, right? as it hits a global pandemic uh, situation, I don't think it's gonna be a V-shape. I think people are talking about uh, 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 Nike swoosh, uh, uh, jacket W, people are inventing alphabets that we have never heard of and stuff like that. So I think, I think we, we still need to be very, very cautious because the, the real uh, impact to the economy is actually when people come back to work and whether uh, businesses will survive and whether people will get unemployed. And so Sudhri, how, how does that compare to what, what you're seeing in, in, in India in particular and, and some of these trends as well? Yeah, so I think uh, broadly speaking uh, in India, you know, we obviously came in later into the process. We, we could see what happened in China and then Italy and then started in the US and then came to India. Uh, we have, you know, global investors. So to some extent, you know, we were also a little bit forewarned that, you know, this thing will happen. Uh, of course, you don't end up taking these things very seriously, you know, until it kind of hits you. Uh, and uh, I think as Jenny said, one of the big things that, uh, you know, we had been planning for a long time is to have work from home. You know, we have like 15,000 agents and we had been thinking all the time that, you know, we should offer an opportunity for people to work from home. And uh, there was a project going on and it was sort of going nowhere, right? And then suddenly in seven days, we flat went from zero to 15,000 people working from home and uh, miraculously and of course due, due to our teams i think everything worked on and it was the 20th of 20th of march so march is you know the biggest season in insurance and uh, the teams were very scared that you know they would not be able to uh, uh, sell in that period and it turned out that we had our best day ever and actually for us march and april were the highest productivity that we've ever had <laughs> so working from home that too so, so I think some of these uh, transitions are forced onto you and, you know, the uh, companies adapt and, you know, the employees adapt uh, better than you would expect. So I think uh, I always say we should uh, have more confidence in, in people than uh, we end up doing. Uh, and I think as a, you know, as a country, India is going through the whole thing in a slightly different way, right? We, we went into a lockdown pretty fast. So, you know, arguably that has slowed the, you know, progress of, of COVID. But uh, we've had a major impact on the economy because of closing it down and also because, you know, as I'm sure some of you know that India is a sort of bipolar economy, right? There is a slightly well-off class of, let's say, 100, 150 million people. And then there is over a billion people, you know, who are not so well-off. And I think both those two classes are facing uh, this in a very different way. 
uh and now actually we are kind of you know gearing up for the shock because you know uh cases are continuing to grow uh the economic impact is becoming clearer and clearer and uh, so i think for india i think the next 3 months are going to be a relatively difficult period uh and we will need all our sort of adaptability and uh, sort of a little bit of courage to you know go through this period i think yeah no it's um it is certainly is sad you know to see some of the challenges that india is going through but but i'm confident that the people will come together and, and there's a resiliency about the indian culture and so i i just wanted to kind of segue slightly on this subway around um your expansion plans i know that you talked a little bit around middle east as being an attractive area for you guys um could could you share a little bit more about that Sure. Uh, so right now we are present in the Middle East. Uh, you know, Policy Bazaar as a brand is uh, well known in India. Uh, we've spent like two hundred million dollars over the last ten years in building this brand, and uh, that brand resonates well in the Middle East. Uh, so we have an office in Dubai, and we serve the Gulf uh, from there. Uh, we have actually taken two approaches to building our business outside India. So one approach is in the Middle East, where we have a consumer-focused uh, franchise and where we are selling, you know, motor insurance, term insurance, etc., to uh, consumers. And the second approach, which we were planning to take for Southeast Asia, where instead of going straight up, uh, you know, and focusing on the consumer, uh, we were planning to use our technology and our relationships that we have with the insurance companies, uh, some of which, you know, are, are present in India and also present in Southeast Asia. to start uh, helping them you know build uh, direct or digital uh, journeys in in uh, southeast asia and sort of enter the market from a technology perspective rather than from a consumer facing perspective uh, now obviously uh, given this uh, situation you know travel and uh, you know meeting etc are not possible so that plan will probably get uh, you know delayed a little bit and interestingly i think we are also now thinking that you know uh, as and when the market start to open and travel is possible that should we now consider a more direct to consumer play because you know as i said now physical agents and banks etc are little less uh, competitive than they were before and you know we have a whole lot of experience in building a direct to consumer business in india uh, and that could also be an opportunity in uh, southeast asia now candidly i will say the challenge is that southeast asia is not one country and you know uh, insurance is a highly regulated business so you have to go sort of uh, literally country by country and figure out you know what will work where Uh, but but i think that's how we are sort of seeing the world and uh, obviously we would like to take advantage of the opportunities that will come our way so sure. and and hopefully those times will be coming quite soon and um i think we can bring up the audience poll now because uh, i'd like to see the results and uh, if we could get maybe dirk to comment is is this what you would have expected um from from the results hmm. i mean everybody has their own crystal ball right so um and and you might call me Nostradamus yesterday but then the next prediction might be off but i think they're all challenges and it depends on on really what industry you are in so concretely let's take a fintech example highly regulated right and 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 we don't have the regulation in place in southeast asia where you can take for instance like simon a hong kong bank license and passport that into indonesia passport that into um vietnam into thailand etc um uh, much like europe would have it right you register once with fsa you get a tier 2 or tier 1 or tier 3 sort of uh, fsa registration to allow you doing doing separate things and you can passport in so i think that's a massive potential hurdle when it comes to anything regulated um if you're looking at obviously physical businesses um then supply chain um will will force you uh to rethink your business and the cost the new costs associated with this and also the risk of just being out of stock which is actually a national risk right and that's where national nationalistic behavior now uh, sort of plays into how can have we have we outlived the old model of adam smith should we still be working in in a global economy where we benefit from the strength of everybody but that's also a function of labor arbitrage and automation right and there essentially the labor arbitrage the costs are going up around the world on the one hand um and 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 you have a high degree of automation so one hypothesis could be we should have giga factories of x not only cars all over the midwest in a us example or the same for 
for India or China. So countries that that are large enough and have large enough of an internal market that have actually would be a beneficiary of such a scenario, right? And and I would actually think that would argue that the U.S. would be huge beneficiary of um, at current status quo where where sort of like a lot of the supply chain moves onshore and is automated through robotics. Um, and then ability to reach customers, I think every, uh, I, I, one of my learnings is that whatever works maybe in Vietnam doesn't translate one-to-one -to, -one to Indonesia on the consumer front. But it's something that I saw historically, and we have a lot of Indians, so 50% of our portfolio is in India. Um, we have a lot of companies that kind of embrace that corridor um, India, Indonesia, both culturally as well as sort of the market and it functions very similarly. So I think they're fundamentally, I think when you, when you think about internationalization as, a, as an entrepreneur and, and you have to think about your product, you have to think about um, sort of like the, the, the localization efforts that are, that are needed, the industry, the physical, non-physical, um, and sort of, I think the key question, because we, we are very early, is really when do you internationalize, right? Like what are sort of the 10 steps you might want to prove out in your home market and gain ground and also not risk losing the home market if it's a large market like, like India and being distracted with a smaller uh, Southeast Asian opportunity? Um, I think those are sort of like some of the bigger questions and abstract questions we go through on a on a call by call basis with founders who are thinking about internationalizing. Sure, and, and I think on that note, it'd be good to kind of um, to see what you, you're seeing, Jenny, in terms of markets that you're potentially prioritizing. Um, yeah, so actually on, on that question as well, I, um, I, I want to add something, right? So I believe that the best entrepreneurs, um, you know, and Simon said it, right? It's not, you know, the test of, um, you know, survival of the fittest is actually the survival of the most adaptable. And so whether it's supply chain, you know, finding your sales, um, you know, finding your right partner, I do believe that, you know, there is a way to get that, right? Um, whether it's by diversifying, you know, your supply chain um, uh, suppliers or um, going, you know, from offline sale, has a bit, um, mentioned as well, to different ways of engaging um, your customers online. I think, you know, those um, are actions we have seen our portfolio companies really pivot. So while there are challenges, I think they are surmountable. I think the part that we worry about, um, which in many cases, it's, it's really beyond, um, you know, the control of the entrepreneur, it's regulatory. Uh, and so I think on the regulatory piece is where we worry a lot. Um, you know, as GGV, we have investments in the U.S., we have investment in China, and obviously in Southeast Asia, and a little bit in the rest of the world, um, where we do see uh, the tensions, right, it's been talked about for a long time, is between China and U.S. And, and so when there are regulatory or blacklists that comes out and said, you, you know, company H, not allowed to sell your component systems into that country, means that it's a complete um, shutdown. Uh, and so I think that those are the challenges that we see, the big macro challenges that we see that would, um, you know, um, you know, maybe, you know, companies will get shut down, right? Because if, if, um, if the core of your customers are international and in regions where you're considered or you're blacklisted, then obviously um, that affects you. Or once you're black, black, uh, blacklisted as well, you know, your supply chain, uh, providers are not allowed to sell to you, then again, that hurts you. So I would say that uh, regulatory um, um, restrictions are the ones that, you know, we, we are most concerned about. Um, they are the ones where we would focus on to say, hey, you know, does it mean that certain region, we may have to tune the sectors that we looked at, um, you know, certain sectors, we may not be able to continue to invest uh, because of some of this overhang. And, you know, should we continue to then expand into areas uh, where it is um, less affected by regulatory? The second area on nationalistic uh, sentiments, uh, again, it's uh, top and center. In fact, even this, this week, right, as we all saw what's happening in the U.S., I think that affects uh, consumption. That affects 
uh, that's on the consumer level uh, as well, you know, beyond uh, um, regulatory, be beyond country level. So I think that's another area that uh, we worry about. Um, and again, it may affect how we think about uh, regions to invest, sectors to invest uh, uh, as well. Just sure. No, no, no that, that, that all makes clear sense and, and, and clearly it's a, it's a complex minefield in, in, in some of these factors and I kind of want to just um, shift over to you Simon slightly around, you know, it's coming up to two years uh, since your JV I believe we're with Astra in Indonesia and just to understand, you know, what are your plans in the region over the next six months to a year? Um, um, so for us, right, um, <coughs> Um, after Hong Kong, after the success of Hong Kong and China, uh, we, were, we were actually looking at uh, where we should expand next, right? I think we looked at Europe uh, when ING invested in us. We also looked at uh, Southeast Asia at the same time Kasana invested in us, right? So at the end, we picked Indonesia because I think it's, we, we love it. It's a fantastic market, big, uh, it's a sizable population, young, uh, energetic, right? Um, I think that the Astra joint venture obviously allow us to tap into their network and with a very strong local partner to do something very innovative. So we brought in actually a lot of the technology that we've tried it out in Hong Kong and, and, and mainland China, and also business models as well, but the B2C and the B2B business models. And we try, we're trying both is in, in Indonesia, right? I think as the world is getting more complex with the coronavirus situation, I think we are focusing increasingly more on Southeast Asia rather than going further. I think we're focusing more on Southeast Asia now. I think one of the one of the plans for, for the next couple of years is uh, whether we should explore or we're planning to explore other uh, additional Southeast Asian markets with similar business model, similar partnerships. Meaning when we expand to a next market, I don't think we'll be going, uh, we will be going as a standalone company. We'll, we'll find like-minded like -minded partners to, uh, to, to partner with, to, to do what we do, right? Um, if you look at what we do, it has to do with uh, accessing to local um, customer base, currency, licenses, relationships, right? We need strong partners to be able to help us to do so, right? So every, every time we go to a, 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 a new prospect, right, we look for, in addition to the market size and whether there is actually a like minded partner, right? So we're thinking about like markets, uh, like with the, the Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines. Um, these are markets with quite similar characteristics and things that uh, experiences that is portable. But having said that, right, I think, I think um, uh, as earlier one of panelists, my fellow panelists, panelists was saying, right, uh, Southeast Asia is not a European Union. It's not EU. I mean, every market is different, different regulators, different currency, different language, right? So I think that's why we're, we're proceeding quite carefully. Um, I think, I think that the, the focus right now is the launch, uh, the, the successful launch of the digital bank in Hong Kong and how we can actually scale that experience across in Southeast Asia. Yeah, it's um, it's clear that from the the audience poll as well, you could see that finding the right partner was was one of the biggest impediments that that, that the audience see. And it's interesting that you see that as your kind of your bridge into a number of these markets. And I think at, at this point, it would be good to kind of bring up our, our second poll, which is all about timing. And you know, I'm just going to caveat this slightly as well. So the question for the audience is around when will cross-border business activity resume back to reasonable levels? And clearly reasonable is very much open to interpretation. Um, in this context, I suppose reasonable is in light of what we've currently been through and a, a, the reasonable test on that. So, so hopefully the, the audience can start to vote on that and um, we can kind of pick that up a bit later. I think um, we want to move over across to different models and sectors and, and Simon you've talked a little bit around the ASEAN region. Dirk it would be interesting to kind of share a little bit more about certain models and sectors uh, or segments within fintech that seem to be doing quite well in the current climate. Sure I mean um, uh, Southeast Asia and India I mean I would say the lower you go in the stack um, the more resilient and resistant the models are, right? And the, the closer you go to the consumer these days in particular, the, the more temporarily challenged it is. Um, so example, if you're, if you're building API marketplaces for, for banks and fintechs to work on or anybody who owns a cohort owner, we invested in companies in India that, that sort of are active on the open API banking um, front called uh, M2P and in Southeast Asia, Brancas. Uh, so these seem to be quite resilient and there's a drive, as I said earlier, where, where 
banking professionals are now, and they're targeting largely Southeast Asia, really rushing to digitalize their operations simply to be ready for a second wave or the fear of a second wave. Um, I think I think anything in the stack. So similarly to WeLab, we 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 invested in a company called Trusting Social that kind of looks at the entire lending stack, if you will, from origination to maintenance and collection and sort of credit scoring in between and and using alternative data sets. What we what we realized there is especially if you were international by nature and not having a huge burn um, and going into the crisis, it was actually a chance because you were able to, to point the gun as the markets were moving in and out of the crisis, right? And your, your sales and your focus and the entire organization was all of a sudden very pointed into one direction. Um, and, and that was a strength because their business continuity could continue around the clock without going into a hard lockdown if they were just focused in one single country. So it became a natural advantage and that was, that was a learning and a refreshing learning for me. Um, I think those are some of the areas that I, that I spend more time on the infrastructure payment and, 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 and uh, open API banking side. Okay. Thanks, Dirk, for sharing. And um, Jenny, how, I know you've already mentioned a few of the areas that, that are kind of exciting you at the moment. Is, is there anything that you haven't already mentioned that you'd like to kind of pick up on in terms of some of the, the, the sectors because you have a broader coverage um, or business models that you see um, seeming to kind of fly right now and, and in the future? Yeah, so I would um, put them into a few buckets, right? So the first bucket for, we actually do see a lot of consumer facing startups um, do well, right? These are the companies that are providing services. Uh, obviously we talk about finance, whether it's banking services online, whether it's payment transfers uh, online, getting insurance online. I think that's that's one area. The second area we, we do see uh, and we talked about as well is education, right? So um, education, online education in all forms and manner, uh, whether it's using AI bots or natural language learning, leveraging teachers from remote locations. I think that's really getting a, a huge, uh, you know, uptake. Uh, and then you have health, right? So telehealth, you know, I, well, I look at a lot of companies in the health sector, never had to use one myself until like a few weeks ago, where it's, it's really not wise to, you know, be in hospitals or clinics. And so, you know, just just getting uh, a good look at my doctor's home. <laughs> it's pretty interesting, right? So, you know, the whole online health, online consultation, uh, and then having having your medication kind of sent to you. So, you know, that's an area which has taken a while to change, but I think the mindset change is happening. Uh, it's, it's really, you know, accelerating that mindset change. Um, we have, uh, obviously, e-commerce companies uh, has also done very well, you know, thanks to all of us being at home whether especially on live, on produce, uh, fresh produce, um, an area that's taken uh, a bit longer as well, because, you know, in Asia, people like to go touch their vegetable and select their fruits. Uh, today, you know, you just order and they show up. So I think on e-commerce as well, um, different sectors within e-commerce also having a, a, a kind of an uptake. Um, and then everything to do with remote office, right? Remote office, cloud infrastructure, uh, collaboration software. I think that's another area I think would be a strong sector going forward. I, I think that there is, there is no assumption that the virus is going to be under control anytime soon, right? There's no assumption that the vaccine is going to be there uh, anytime soon. And so I think that startups are, you know, uh, getting ready uh, to go, um, you know, remote office for a longer time. And so we are seeing in some of our portfolio companies, free licensed users now converting to paid if you were a kind of free Zoom user, you're going to pay now to ensure that, you know, your businesses continues, your, your employees continue to have the right type of uh, tools to allow them to work. And then I think lastly, um, an area that has short-term impact from the virus because of supply chain, but on a longer term basis as well, um, we'll see additional support and um, increase, uh, increased growth and that's automation. Right, a lot has been said about robots, right? Robots at home, robots at hospitals, at restaurants, you know, and um, I mentioned cleaning robots. You know, it's always been an ROI issue, right? The cost is too high, the unit volume is too low, it's hard to get this going. 
But I think that again, with uh, what's going on today with the virus, uh, businesses are rethinking, right? If it's, it's not just about cost anymore, it's about safety, right? Is it safer to deploy the bots cleaning your floor than to have people there? Um, for warehouse, you know, can you now automate versus having to hire tens of thousands of people to come in? And so I, I think that that whole mindset sh uh, shift is happening as well. Uh, and therefore, um, you know, automation, um, even smart city, right? Um, how do you now ensure that uh, people are downloading your safe entry app and being tracked? Uh, I think some of that whole mindset around, um, uh, you know, data privacy, um, and uh, transparency, that's gonna get a rethink as well. So I think the new world as we talked about isn't just singular, I, I actually see it, you know, multiple for start in all these areas. The areas that's gonna suffer obviously is offline, right? What's gonna happen to offline retail? Um, and I think that, that uh, offline retail, offline travel, tourism, uh, those, um, that's gonna take some time, um, you know, to come back. And I think if anything, they may not come back to pre-virus situation. So even that travel redefined, um, restaurants redefined, I, I think that's another area where um, we may see new models, but existing models uh, as it is, um, definitely will be in for some tough time. Yeah, no, that, that makes absolute sense. And I think this boils down to also one of the comments you made earlier in the week, Dirk, about um, know your health. And, and that could be something that ends up being, you know, quite an important factor over the coming kind of months, um, if not if not year. And yeah. I just want to bring up the, before you, you comment on that, Dirk, because I, I know you're itching to, I just want to bring up the results of the audience poll. Um, did, did, did any of you expect this to be the case? Anyone disagree? So I would probably be a bit more bearish. Um, why um because like like we all love investing in network effects right and we have a somehow an understanding how network effects form and they usually form very local and then they grow and grow and grow and they grow beyond a country's border and then they're global in nature so if you have to unwind a negative network effect which we're currently dealing with which is being imposed here in the question when is international and cross-border activity being resumed at full capacity again, um, I think that's a tricky one to unwind because it's cross-border and sits sort of on the edge of liquidity, if you will, and not at the center. The center will be localized. So the focus of getting this disentangled is in full swing right now. And I think like addressing it internationally and then having the first few sort of exchanges of imported cases again, it's not gonna accelerate it. Sorry. Someone else? That's okay. That's um, that's very. Yeah, my my view is uh, it's both consumer sentiments, um, but also government, right? The fact that U.S. and China has declared that the national carriers cannot fly means that there is no international travel. The fact that Singapore and China says that hey, you know, we're going to resume some form of flights on June eighth, right? Uh, means that there will be some level of activity. So I I do feel that businesses that has to do cross border businesses. And the resilient one will try, but you know, it's um, assuming, you know, health checks and you know, the process is in place. The other big piece is really, you know, with the con at, at the country level, um, is there, you know, will the flights resume? And if they do, I, I think it will come back. Uh, I like to see six to 12 months as well, though right now, um, between the two largest trade partner, if uh, things are still shut down, then I think this is gonna take some time. Well, they may have no choice but to, uh, to, to to open up a little bit more. So I'm um, hoping that's the case. And there's a couple of audience questions that's come in that I'm just picking up on. And, and one was for you, Simon, around um, some of the, um, what uh, advice is, is are your investors giving you in respect of um, ex your expansion plan, so your internationalization? Um, thankfully, our investors and our board are, uh, are pretty confident with us. So uh, um, they, 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 I think obvi obviously they, they, they quite rely on our judgment, right? But I think um, in what we are sharing with our board and our investors too, right? I think at this point in time, right, what is most important is liquidity, cash flow. Okay, that's the most important thing. I think people need to figure out what is the optimal operating model uh, at this stage. And then what, when, when do you think business will resume? 
and obviously you have multiple cases, right? Third quarter, fourth quarter, next year, and then how are, how is your business going to be? How 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 are you going to modify your business to adapt to that, right? So I think that's that's mostly what we what we're looking at right now. Um, obviously we can't interna- we can't expand internationally. Or think about international expansion if uh, the borders are still shut. I think that that's that's natural, right? Um, but I think there's still a lot of things that we can do. Thankfully, in the three markets that we we are in currently, still has a lot of potential. So uh, we're not running out of uh, target customers today. So that, that's really good to hear. And um, but we're, we're coming close to the end of the session. There's another five minutes left, and there was one question I just wanted to pick up on, and. Um, it, it's basically a question that's come in around what advice, Jenny, can you give to investors in Southeast Asia? In particular, I want you to kind of pick up on some of the, you know, you mentioned earlier this week around um, a due diligence process over Zoom. You know, there's an interesting IPO story that you you might be willing to share. But but in the context of all of this, you know, you've you've kind of weathered a number of storms, as, as you mentioned earlier. Um, what, what advice can you give um, to investors in Southeast Asia? Well, I, I, I think that the, um, you know, our perspective for China, U.S. and Southeast Asia means that as investors, we can balance right across the the region, the markets, um, and we can manage our portfolio accordingly based on where we see that growth. Like for example, China is up and growing. Um, in fact, investments are happening as we speak. We actually deploy capital. We close deals. Um, doing online due diligence um, because the market is there, the government is supporting that recovery. U.S. is generally kind of low uh, right now, uh, given what's happening. Uh, Southeast Asia, so I think, you know, when we look at Southeast Asia, my advice to Southeast Asia investors is really spend that time uh, to ensure that your portfolio companies, if you're only focused on Southeast Asia and there's less of that regional or or international diversification that you can have on your portfolio construction, uh, then, you know, make sure, first of all, that the portfolio you have is strong. Uh, work with them on cash runway, work with them on restructuring their OPEX, help them on financing. Um, you know, we have 200 over active companies across our portfolio and close to 90% of our portfolio companies has over 12 months of cash runway, assuming no revenue for 12 months. And that's not true because most of the companies have revenue. So we take the most conservative approach and we do a runway analysis. So I would say number one, always, um, you know, uh, take care of your portfolio, make sure it's strong. Once your house is in order, um, then help them to grow. In sectors that I mentioned, whether it's education, fintech, I think there's always a way, um, you know, to figure out generating more revenue. A portfolio company of ours in Singapore was doing 3D printing for like um, dentist uh, dentures they pivot their business for 3D printing to do swaps <laughs> during this period to help the government with all the tests, right? So some of that pivot may be short term, shop, some of that pivot may be a new business direction, but no innovation happened without trying. And so I think once the companies are in the safe spot in terms of cash runway, work with a portfolio to figure out is there new ways to generate revenue? Is there new ways to generate uh, models? I think that uh, in this tough time, the LPs, the investors, they want to continue to back GPs that has a strong portfolio. Um, Their gripe, if any, whenever they talk about Southeast Asia, is that the investors here, not all, but, you know, a lot of the investors in Southeast Asia have not seen downturns, have not seen down cycles. And so, you know, the ones that can emerge with a strong portfolio, the ones that can emerge, you know, with navigating their companies to a a good state, um, I think we'll, in, in our words as well, for VCs, the survival of the fittest <laughs> means, you know, you, you really got to help to put down your, your portfolio companies. So I, I think that, um, you know, that, that would be a few levels of, of advice for the portfolio, com- uh, for the investors here in Southeast Asia. Generally, from an international perspective, there is concern about Southeast Asia. Right, we talked about first order impact in China. China is now almost back. Second order impact, US, the Western market, and then the third order impact. I, I feel that we are only just beginning to see third order impact. And so whether it's in Indonesia or in India, that sentiments, and for right or for wrong, I think the sentiments is that the worst is not over yet. And therefore, I do think that in that short term, um, you know, great companies will still get funding, but valuation will be, you know, negotiated. 
um, you know, the ones in the middle uh, will have a bit of a tougher time, may take longer to do fundraising. And that's why the cash runway analysis becomes very, very important uh, as well. So um, a bit of that, you know, play defensive and only when you're strong do you play, you know, offensive uh, on that few uh, great companies. Sure. And it's going to be, as, as you mentioned, survival of the most adaptable. And um, I think, sadly, we've come to the end of our show. And um, as with each episode, we finish off with our signature green shoot story from, from each of you guys on the panel. And um, we also have Laura from the Milken Institute who will be sharing her green story as well. Um, and this story can be something you've read or you've seen or experienced, whether in your personal life or professional one. Um, although I was going to say personal and professional life seems to clearly be blurred these days. Um, so maybe, um, Subvi, you can um, share, share your green shoot story, please. Subfear, I think he's um, maybe temporarily dropped off. Um, Simon, can you share your green shoot story, please? Yeah, I can, I can share uh, one of the interesting initiatives that we're doing uh, that we mentioned at the beginning, the HK Cash Drop, right? <laughs> um, so I think as a, as a, as a homegrown fintech company, um, we, want, we, we feel responsible to help the local community during this very tough period, right? And then um, an opportunity came up when the Hong Kong government announced they're going to give every single Hong Kong uh, permanent resident above the age of 18, around 10,000 Hong Kong dollars. So we, and, and their plan is to give it out somewhere in July and August. So we said with the technology that we have, can we actually, not just technology, with the technology licenses, resources, access to capital we have, right? Can we actually give the 10,000 Hong Kong dollars to everyone now, immediately? And as soon as they receive the money from the government, they just pay us back completely interest-free, Everything is very no hurdle, no, 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 no bells and whistles, right? So we actually launched that in, in May and it's an incredibly popular campaign. And we feel we, we're doing that, right? It's, we don't make any money. In fact, we have to absorb all the costs ourselves, right? We're doing that because we feel that government subsidies trigger a multiply effect in the economy. Meaning when you get $10,000 from government, you go and buy groceries, you go to buy some something, right? And that, that little shop SME can pay salary, the, the employee can hence go and buy a bowl of noodle. That multiply effects, the earlier we can kick in, the faster we can kick, kick start the economy. The second reason why we are doing this is purely to, to inject some positive energy. So we just say everyone loves the early Christmas. So we just started doing that uh, in May and uh, it, it's been incred incredibly popular. People really appreciate it. In fact, the most co popular comment received on social media is too good to be true. <laughs> so, we need, so we need to explain to people is, is we're really doing that out of our own, own pocket and, and we just want to help the, 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 the local economy. That Thank sounds you. good to be true, but um, I was going to say it's nice that you're spreading the good vibes. And um, Dirk, can you share your, your green shoot story? Sure. Um, it's much along the lines of what Simon said. I think it's the wrong time to be greedy, right? It's, it's, it's important, I think, and you can get a lot of goodwill by being a good citizen these days. And, and one of the activities that we participated in in India is it's such a large market is really leveraging the power of innovation by founders. And it was really rewarding to see how, how it came together. It's an initiative called ACT, which is essentially um, a few venture capitalists and ecosystem builders that came together, raised a $10 million type fund in a foundation. There's no profit motive um, associated with it. We at a partner level uh, donated uh, money into this initiative and then participated just what we do every day, i.e. assessing deals, but structuring it along the value chain of fighting COVID. And 100 volunteers came together from startup world, 60 days of volunteering. Um, we raised over $10 million for grants, i.e. we don't expect any money back, to fight really jointly against COVID. And, and we targeted eight categories from really prevention to ICU and wrote over 50 grants and happy to say that 50% of current capacity of India's testing capacity is done by one of the startups there, right? And we hope more, more is gonna come out of this. So that was a very rewarding cross ecosystem activity with an impact. That's really good to hear um, people coming together and um, for, for a common cause. And, and I think um, we wish that initiative well. And, and Sadhvi, it's, it's great that you've uh, rejoined us and um, you've come Sorry, yeah. Perfect time. No, absolutely fine. Um, this is uh, the green shoot story. So if you could just quickly let us know your, your green shoots 
story, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we've had a lot of heartening stories in our uh, network and in, in, you know, in, in some of the consumers that we've been able to serve and, and some of the agents. Uh, you know, we, we have a lot of uh, people who uh, are from smaller cities who come and work, you know, for us in, uh, in uh, where we are headquartered. And uh, several of them, you know, were obviously their parents were scared about them and they were, they didn't, they were worried that they would, you know, be stuck all alone. So we helped uh, several of them, you know, actually go back to their uh, homes and have Wi-Fi access and computers, etc. We bought like 5,000 tablets and things like that. And, you know, some of the kind of letters and the stories that they've been writing, because uh, as I told you earlier, this has been a good season for us. So they have been able to not only be with their families, but also earn a lot of money, uh, which, you know, in a moment when uh, there is so much economic uh, sort of concern around uh, salaries, etc., uh, the fact that these people have been able to earn well and you know look after their families and uh, sort of be with them physically uh, this has given us a lot of hope and uh, we've actually realized that you know this whole uh, business of forcing people to sit in one place and is perhaps not required at all and uh, we are eagerly looking forward to actually you know hiring uh, for instance more women you know we used to lose uh, some of the uh, good performing women because they had to go back and start their families etc uh, so, so I think it's just kind of uh, what is uh, heartwarming for us is that it's opened a whole new frontier for how we can run the business. And, uh, you know, you know, we, we like the fact that we are able to give an earnings opportunity to our agents. We actually have goals around that. I mean, as to how many of them will earn uh, over 100,000 rupees a month. That's one of the stated goals of our company. So I think, uh, you know, what is heartwarming is in all these problems and chaos, uh, some opportunities have emerged and, uh, we sort of eagerly look forward to making them work for our uh, employees. Yeah, that's absolutely heartwarming to support people through um, some of the economic challenges that are going on. Um, and then on to, the, on to our next speaker, um, your green shoot story, please, Jenny. Yeah, so I, I uh, maybe on a different angle, um, you know, while there's a lot of anxiety and there's gloom and there's fear out there, I do want to say that, you know, in the venture industry, uh, and in the capital market, there is liquidity. I think there's, there was a lot of concern about, is there liquidity, enough capital? Um, and the answer is yes, right? So on the venture side, um, there's still a lot of dry powder, you know, um, out there. Uh, at GGV, we deployed, even with that virus situation, over 100 million in Q1. We expect to deploy between 100 to 200 million in Q2. Um, and on the uh, public side, I think Pat was alluding to it as well, um, you know, despite everything that's going on, one of our Chinese portfolio company is going public this, this month in the U.S. And you would wonder, right, with all that shutdown, with all that travel restriction, how is that being done? So our portfolio company now, instead of having to do a 9 to 14 days roadshow, is now only, um, they are only required to do a 2 to 3 days of online virtual roadshow. And so the whole IPO would be wrapped up within 4 days from start to pricing. I'm still wondering how you ring the bell, but you know, we'll figure that out. But mm -hmm. what I want to say is that I think that, you know, even on the public side, if you're a great company doing well, if you still need to tap the right level of capital, whether it's private capital or public capital, actually the market is still there. And we're talking about, you know, a US market is that is in lockdown. I think the liquidity is still there. The investors are still looking. Uh, and so, you know, I'm very happy to to say that um, you know when that's when when that is still available, I think entrepreneurs um, do not lose hope, right? I, I think that there is enough um, you know good vibe out there, enough good capital out there, enough good investors out there that will be there as you continue to kind of dig this out and and grow. That's a great message to the startup community and, and, and seriously, thank you for, for sharing your insights there. And um, we're almost done now. I was going to just um, introduce Laura to, to share her Green Shoots uh, story. Take it away, Laura. Thanks, Pat. Um, I just wanted to do something more on the, the human side. Uh, I'm on the board of NTU's, the Singapore University NTU's uh, Aging a rise board that focuses on aging the elderly in Singapore. And what we've seen is the adoption of technology for 70 plus uh, you know, citizens of Singapore in terms of now they, 
they do telemedicine, they are staying connected with their friends, they're avoiding isolation, they're ordering food from home. So the adoption technology has improved the lives and there are things that we've been working on for years and, and it's just been completely accelerated. So I think it's exciting as well, uh, some of these changes. That's brilliant. That is really a great cross-section of Green Shoot stories and I'm sure you will see some of these posted on, on LinkedIn over the coming weeks. Um, I just want to thank everyone, um, thank our panellists, uh, thank the audience for joining in. Um, it's been a really insightful conversation. Um, so we're taking a break next week and we're going to be back with a surprise session the following week which will include one of the leading bank CEOs in the world. I can't let you know who that is yet but um, soon to be revealed. Um, so also for the audience, please let us know the topics you want to hear about in the future. You can reach out on our Telegram group or, or on LinkedIn. And uh, thanks for tuning in and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. everyone. Bye.